Kirk's in the water. Are we clear to cut her loose? Yeah, uh, looks like I'm gonna push away when we go in the water. Yep. Did we lose a uh, picture on, oh there it is, it's just dark. Okay, never mind. the ship a little faster, Robert. Bridge control, can we increase uh, track 0 0.5? Roger, 0 0.5, okay. Deck control, this is about as far as her can go right now. Um, are we okay to launch? Uh, let's try and pick up the vessel speed a little bit. Drag him around the back just a little bit more. Bridge control, can we increase speed to 0 0.7 knots? We will try, but uh, I, I don't think that it's possible. Copy that.
Control van deck, you might try submerging Herc a couple meters below that swell there and you'll have a little bit better luck uh, louder one over. Copy, you will try. Roger, thank you. Deck control, uh, we have the ship increased speed there probably as much as it can and um, we're, f we're looking at this is about as good as it's going to get. Um, so if we want to, if we want to launch, we launch. If not, we can recover. Roger, we'll watch it for a few more minutes and see if it improves or gets worse. It's right on the edge of the angle there, I would say. Okay, copy. Dan, I can't drive down and drive, you know, lateral because it's just not going to work. I don't have enough power. Roger. You're, uh, yeah, you're right on the edge of winning the game there. You fall off outside of the box and you're back in, back out, back in, so. It's better than it was, though.
Dad. We're we're fifty fifty here. Got a coin? Got a lucky coin? Either way, but let's just make a decision. That's my that's my thought. Otherwise we risk that, that if it goes south then that tether is gonna get rubbed by the time we can get the daisy chain on. I don't feel any hurry to do make a decision. We're holding. Uh, but if we make the decision to go, we might, you know, bump that line a little bit on the way out. Let's change uh, um, our heading 10 degrees to starboard. Uh, Captain, if you can maintain our forward way and change the heading, then um, that seems like a good uh, a good move. Okay, we will try. Roger, Roger. We copy down here. Repeat that deck. Uh, what's this calling nav? Nav deck, what do you think? How's it looking from here? So... Yeah, Roger. Looks like we're in the pocket. As long as the captain's uh, comfortable, I'd say we're good. Yeah, you can proceed, deck. Okay, bridge. Thank you. We're going to proceed with the launch.
in the water. Hercules and Atalanta are dive, dive, dive. One more time. This is an audio slate for dive H2010, expedition NA154. ETC time is 0652.45. Mark. I think he. I think he should have waited. <laughs> I think we should have waited. Last night, cowboy up. No. All right, get your hat on. Who's the star? Thanks for your patience, everyone.
Hello and welcome to the 8 to 12 watch, 12th and final dive of Ala Amoana Kaiuli expedition. We're excited, maybe a little sad, um, but as Dan said, cowboy up. Here we go. Uh, this, is, this is our last dive. This is Daniel Kinzer, science communication fellow. If you were watching, there was some uh, excitement in launch and uh, we were letting the uh, deck crew and and uh, the front row and the bridge do their communication so well, masterfully getting both ROVs in the water. We're experiencing some of the, it's not super high swell, but it's definitely the highest swell and highest winds of, of our expedition so far over the last couple of days. So it was high enough. <laughs> high enough, some of us, it was plenty high. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're feeling good on the eight to 12 watch. We're here to bring you the deep sea live uh, you got to put up with us for some uh, some blue water, but uh, we'll, we'll be down <laughs> again. <laughs> we'll be down in likely about an hour and a half. So we're glad you're here. Thanks for tuning in. Leave your questions, comments, stories, and uh, yeah, welcome welcome to the greatest show on the internet. <laughs> Eight to twelve <laughs> watch. <laughs> Let's go. What do you say, back row? Want to introduce ourselves? Sure. Want me to start? Please. All right. Dr. Uh, Isotopes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Contrary to popular belief, uh, my name is Val Finlayson. I am a <laughs> I, I'm an, I'm a postdoc at uh, University of Maryland, um, specialize in isotope geochemistry of uh, seamounts, uh, much like this one, much like any of the others that we've uh, 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 visited on this expedition. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Definitely some mixed feelings about this one being the uh, last dive of the expedition because you never want these to end, but you're also happy to go home. So. Virginia? Oh, Robert, you need us to, you need us to be quiet? No. He's good. He's uh, pulling out his munchies, so. Yeah. Oreos. He's happy. Yeah. Cookie. Virginia, over to you. We're good. Hi all, um, I'm Virginia. I'm a PhD student at Florida State University. I study the ecology on some of these sea mounts, particularly the deep sea, um, below 200 meter deep sea coral and sponge communities. I'm so excited, so, so like grateful that I could be a part of this cruise for and all these dives and, you know, a part of this Great eight to twelve watch, and uh, excited to be a part of in this this dive and see what we uh, see what we see. Mahalo, oh, Virginia. Our light, our library of knowledge, kukui. Mahalo nui dan aloha, velina mai meke aloha nui yakakua po ovo kukui no moio. Mahalo everybody. My name's Kukui. Um, I'm from the island of Maui. I am one of the data loggers on board. And I am so blessed and grateful to be able to be here with you all again um, for, I think, our, our last night cruise or our last night watch of this expedition. It's definitely been a pleasure and an honor and a tremendous gift to be able to learn from everybody on, on board as well as on shore. And um, my mom wanted to tell me, to tell you guys, that they will really miss watching our dives huh. and that <laughs> we're better than anything that they have seen on TV. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh. 
we love your ohana kukui and yeah. they've uh, they've done a great job raising a incredible incredible young mana wahine so tell them we said thanks for that yeah we're gonna miss seeing their comments in the chat <laughs> Most definitely. over to you heavenly moon Ano ay mea ke aloha, o mahina lani kavaleri ko uinoa no o ahu mai ao. Hello everyone, my name is Mahina Lani, and it is a bittersweet feeling, a lot of mixed emotions coming up on this last dive of the Ala Omoana Kaiuli and Papahana Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, as Kukui has mentioned, and our other crew members sitting in the control van, it has been an absolute pleasure and a great gift just learning um, alongside these beautiful people with them and then just discovering what the kaiuli, the ocean depths, and kanaloa is willing to reveal to us. Um, I know that it has been a transformative experience for me just to be on board Nautilus and it is my first time on and I'm just so grateful uh, to have experienced this with the crew that we have on board as well as our support, our scientists and crew ashore. It's a big kako effort, a big um, you know, effort of collaboration across communities and different universities, partners all around the continent and the globe. So just feeling very grateful, um, kind of in disbelief that it's already come to an end. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing what we will be able to see this evening. Oh. Mahalo, Mahina. We're going to let the front row take care of some operations. This is going to be a little bit of a trickier dive out here in these conditions. And we are diving on the planet's largest volcano, Onunui, Onuiki, or otherwise known as Gardner Pinnacles, by volume. We think the planet's largest volcano and a massive landmass under the water, a tiny little dot of an island <laughs> yep. above. But uh, uh, I like that. I'm, I'm excited for us. We're still about 500 miles away from, from home for me um, and a few others and, uh, and the next port stop for, for those who will then scatter uh, yeah. across the country. But uh, so we're, we're a thousand miles closer to home than we were um, at our furthest reach uh, from Oahu. But uh, uh, we're still we're still 500 miles away. We'll be diving to a depth uh, of almost 2,500 meters, 2,450, um, doing a deeper dive than has been previously done. Uh, there's been a few other, a handful of other dives done on Gardner Pinnacles, um, but not this deep. Uh, we're looking forward to see what life is flourishing down there in the depths of Papahanaumokuakea. Regardless of what we see, it's uh, like everyone has said, it's such a treat, um, such a gift such a privilege to uh, to be in this space and to have all of you deep sea travelers with us so thank you for being here we won't see any erupting volcanoes these are still long extinct um, some of our viewers hoping maybe maybe we'd get uh, massive eruptions but we'd have to travel several hundred miles down the hawaiian island chain to to see any of that but uh, yeah or we're, even we're further we're south down to uh lao basin or tonga that's right lao yep. basin and tonga super active so um you know that's uh, that's okay. We like our ancient volcanoes too. Got to respect oh, your sure elders. Uh, and uh, these are some Kopuna Islands for sure. So such a such a treat um, to be in this space. Yeah, these old volcanoes are sometimes the most compelling part of the story we're trying to tell I geologically. Love I love it. Front row now. Now a good time. You guys want to introduce yourselves? You feeling up for it? Who wants to go first? They're looking at each other. Um, I'll get it started. <laughs> My name is Catalina. I am here serving as a navigator. I am a master's student at University of South Florida's College of Marine Science. And, yep, can't believe it's our last dive, but here we are. We almost didn't have it, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robert Waters. I'm uh, in the Herc seat for the last go round here. <laughs> That's all I got. That's all I got. Moving on. <laughs> Roger that. Yeah. I'm Zach Gonzalez, um, Graham Poobah's left hand man. this <laughs> <laughs> time. And uh I've been doing R V for a few years and that's it. Amber? Hi. Amber Flynn, uh, video engineer. Uh, yeah, thrilled to be here and, and bittersweet that it's our last one. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this is Amber's last go here this year, huh? It is, yeah. But I'll see you all next year. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, so the volcano that we're uh, diving on tonight is uh, uh, almost certainly the youngest one that we have uh, uh, explored during this uh, uh, expedition. It's about 12.5 to 14.1 million years old. And, uh, it's estimated at twice the size of Mauna Loa on wow. the Big Island. Uh, That's and a big yeah, as far as we can tell, it's the largest known shield volcano, although the title of largest volcano on the planet is actually uh, um, up for debate because another one has been named the uh, world's largest volcano, and that one's called uh, Tamu Massif. Yeah, up near Japan, right? Uh, I believe so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've heard they're trying to compete with our Hawaiian volcano, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not buying it. Yeah, there's a paper that came out about Tamu Massif a few years ago that was... Pretty interesting. Besides, you know, you know, it, it that was one of the uh, claims it made, but just some of the uh, geologic history that they were able to pull up about it was pretty interesting. Very old, so, right? Tamu uh, Massif, uh, very old. If I remember correctly, it's a uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 120 million years. I'm I'm verifying that right now. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. So was this a big island here at one time, or? It may it have been. Yeah. No, it's just some <laughs> a handful of very very small rocks that stick up above the waterline. Yeah. You don't know if it was an island back in the, the day? I imagine there would have been a pretty substantial island. Yeah, during the last ice age, Cause if, likely. If it's still above water now and it's been subsiding uh, as, as the seafloor kind of sinks back down off of the uh, hot spot swell, it, it would have uh, it would have almost certainly sat far higher at, um, when it was uh, sitting on top of the hot spot. So where's the... the Top of the mound here. Like what was that? Where's the, the shallow spot? Just to the south of us. And how deep is that? Mm. Well, besides, I guess it's got little islands poking up. But. Yeah. Um, I will have to. Uh, I know there's an expansive. I know there's an expansive underwater reef. You know, fairly shallow tropical reef surrounding. Gardner's, Gardner's Pinnacles, so um, I know it stays yeah. shallow for a, a pretty good distance from the island itself. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not able to pull some of the uh, best elevations out on this quickly, but um, yeah, what we was, can. Uh, what look was that the question up. again? Um, basically, how shallow is this this area? Um, um, so up I'm gonna go find a, a contour map above. Um, it's a. It's a. Well, most most of the most of the geo structure is uh, submarine. What? Well, most of the geo structure here is submarine. Yeah. I just don't remember exactly how deep. Um, we're we're going down to about twenty yeah, five hundred I mean, to start. Yeah. Gardner yeah. Pinnacles yeah, is above that table the sea floor or er, above the Gardner, surface. Yeah, barely, but it's just a teeny tiny little piece of this, and then you have this pretty large uh, geo structure that's submarine here. Oh, oh, yeah, I see yeah. what you mean. I was like, it. The <laughs> holly, the highest point is. A, is not actually below the water. I yeah. was not understanding that. I was like, no, guys, it actually isn't below the water. <laughs> like, no. We lost we're Virginia not, for a little bit. We're not getting anywhere in the shallows, though. Yeah, right? it, that's what I was like. Uh, we're not. We're not reaching there. No. A monster yeah. of a volcano with an itty bitty little subaerial bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of where I was going with that. <laughs> I like the shallows. Zach and Robert, someone, uh, one of our viewers online wants to know, what are the qualifications for an ROV pilot? Do you need a license or can just about anybody do it? <laughs> so uh, I don't know about Robert, but I like to look from my experience. So I applied for a position at another company at one point, and they had their series of trainings and stuff like that. But each place has their own way of training and stuff like that. So take it with a grain of salt or how you want to take that. Because, you know, every, every place is going to train you differently. You're going to meet someone else, they're going to train you differently. And it's just, I heard some places do give you certifications. Um, there are classes for it too, I think. Right, Robert? Well, I mean, it's that's oil and gas is going to yeah. be a different situation than doing the research stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, because I came from oil and gas, so I mean, it, it's a completely different world for me. 
Um, but like I said, I, I came from that. I don't, I don't know how else you, someone yeah. else could without experience coming to this. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know the basis of that, but Robert, Robert probably knows a little bit more than I do about that. Well, a lot of people come up as, uh, you know, they come out here as an intern and work their way up, right? So you come out, you get a cruise out here as an intern, and then, you know, if you work out, then they invite you back, and then, you you know, you're in a paid position, and and eventually you get in the pilot seat. So that's the way it works here. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but some people come from, like, the MATE program, and... Uh, I don't remember what MATE stands for, Marine something technical education or something. But we could 3D print them a little license if we wanted, right? That'd be yeah, fun. Yeah, we don't, we don't have, we no, don't have <laughs> certifications. Like, we don't, you don't get a certificate for ROV pilot. If, yeah. you, if you go to, if you go to work at Huey and work on the Alvin submarine, you have to get U.S. Navy certified as a deep submergence pilot. They actually give you a... A U.S. Navy official certificate and, uh, and a, a pen, uh, you know, real Navy pen. A real Navy pen? Yeah. Oh, we need to start giving people stuff. We need certificates <laughs> and so pens. Then, you know, that's not just a that's not just a decorative thing. I mean, you've, it's you know, you're U.S. Navy certified. It's, yeah, that's serious. Yeah. That's awesome. It's not that easy. Is. It takes a couple years to get that. Wow. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. You have to go through five boards, I think, to get there. Oh my gosh. The last one being a Navy board in front of a bunch of Navy officers that are going to grill you on situational things. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's all part of the safety going down in uh, Alvin, sending people down in submersibles. It's a whole different ball game, really, than, uh, than sending robots down, sending our ROVs down. But. Uh, Awesome to know. Thank you both for that input. So the short answer is just about anybody can do it, but it might take you a few years. You might have to get yourself an internship. You might have to get yourself a job and get trained up. But uh, if it's something you want to do, go after it. You too can come sit next to Aquaman <laughs> and learn, learn how to fly underwater. <laughs> So flying the ROV is the easy part. <laughs> yeah, fixing you know, it, I getting it ready. People, in general, people can sit here for an hour and be relatively good at it. Uh -huh. Generally. What What's the most challenging part, Robert? Uh, manipulating is harder. The hardest part is fixing it when it's broken. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. It happens on deck. Yeah, it happens on shore. That's the That's the most important part, I'd say. Some people so say similar things about our voyaging canoes. It takes so much effort and love and care and attention and attention to detail and putting things together, getting the canoe ready to voyage, uh, yeah. making sure it's uh, not going to fall apart when it gets out in the ocean. Most definitely. So. Very cool. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces to these things, and it's all got to work, so... So I don't have a great map that I'm able to pull up here, but it uh, looks like that uh, uh, Gio portion of the volcano uh, it gets as shallow as uh, close to 100 meters, somewhere 100 between meters. 100 and 200 meters. Oh, oh Mahalo. That's perfect. Yeah. That's where we want to be. <laughs> that's where we want to be. Yeah, we'll see all kinds of action. Yeah. Probably see some uh, great. <laughs> place to see coral outcrops at those depths. Yeah. Yeah, it's really a massive, supposedly, I have not been, but uh, researchers have encountered a higher diversity of, of tropical fish um, around Gardner Pinnacles than anywhere else in the Hawaiian Islands. There's uh, massive populations, healthy populations of top apex predators, pelagic predators. There's uh, just so much, and even on the island itself, famous for its opihi, um, and has a whole, even though it's very small, um, a whole assortment of various land critters and creatures that have uh, made those tiny rocks sticking out in the middle of Papahanaumokuakea, their home. So, uh, 
sacred island for sure, abundant in life, and hopefully we'll get to encounter some of that life. Faunal assemblages, as it's uh, put in our dive plan. <laughs> Faunal assemblages. Speaking of faunal assemblages, we really do have an amazing crew assembled here in the control van on 8 to 12, and uh, I've been admiring them and uh, celebrating them throughout, much to uh, Aquaman's chagrin. He's probably tired of it, but it's... Uh, it's I'm st tired of staring at my bald spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a true feeling. Uh, it is, uh, I hold it deep in my heart, and so... I, just a few words in this blue water while we go down. If you'll entertain me, feel free to interrupt. I'll, uh, I'll uh, find a sneaky spot to get back to it later. But Val, I want to start with you, um, our incredible watch lead, as a playful, frenetic, and just like the igneous rocks you study and admire, foundational to this team, you are a deep sea volcano making and shaping the earth, even if nobody is watching. Aww. So thank you, Val. Appreciate you. You too, man. Mm. Virginia, the ecologist, the one who sees the relationships and their value and their need for cultivation and study. As you journey to find your own place on our team and in this world, you invite us all in. Thank you so much. We're going pretty mm. slow. Oh, I didn't thank hear you, you say that. Too much going on. What's going on? Oh no. Kukui, as everyone knows, our light, our library, our medicine, delivered with yeah. such joy and humility. Uh, all right, I gotta go. Our okay. very own Maui, carrying us into the depths and bringing us safely home. You are on an incredible path because you are that path. And we love you, Kukui. Mahalo nui, Dad. Mm. Wow. I'd go longer, but I knew Robert wouldn't let me. <laughs> to my left, the amazing heavenly moon, Mahina Lani, our guide in the darkness, such a beautiful reflection of your teachers. Your poetic voice clarifies and reminds me of the distinction between Ao and Po, the reverence and gratitude we owe to Kanaloa, and the privilege and responsibility we carry for having entered the sacred realm of all the ancestors and of all future generations. We are traveling together through Papahanao Mokuakea. We also share sometimes spoken and often unspoken the shared understanding that comes with voyaging together with our friends on our Va'akaulua. I love seeing the ocean through your eyes. You are a true crewmate. Mahalo. Oh, mahalo, Dad. Thank you. Amber, quietly, delicately, bringing this life, bringing the life and colors and shapes of the depths into focus. Diligent in your work, but even more diligent in your care and in your aloha. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Dad. Zach, Tex, <laughs> you are so much more than a Padawan. Your Texas-sized love of your family, your desire to grow, your incredible joy, and your playful and adventurous spirit are needed, and they belong here. And they brighten our journey together. Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Robert escaped so he didn't have to listen to my... Uh, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it now, and I'm going to read it again when he comes back. Good choice. Robert, our Aquaman... You've lived a life like every children's dream, spent seeking the treasures buried beneath the ocean, bearing the beauty and the scars of the depths to one day awaken from this child's dream to realize that you, my friend, in fact, are the dream and the treasure. Love you, Robert. And last but certainly not least, our very own Catalina de Mar, so open to the world while so creative, focused, and masterful on the work in front of you, such a force, and yet so calm and gentle and giving with your talents. You are so much like the ocean that you map and love and protect, how deeply you inspire and draw the best out in others, and how quickly you also feel like the safety of family and old friends. Mahalo. Thank you, Katalina. Thank you, Dan. So, Robert gets his later. 
<laughs> with a pahi. <laughs> but uh, really do, real feelings. Mm -hmm. um, share with you guys, it's been an incredible journey. Our last dive I know is gonna just expand the gift even further, but uh, so much, so much fun had with you all. Look forward to doing it again. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Daniel, even though my words are, are not as poetic, I, we, <laughs> just, we just want to thank you for being our teacher, for being our guide throughout all of this, for facilitating such great conversations, conversations that it brings so much joy, and also those hard conversations as well that has to be had. Mm -hmm. So we mahalo you for that, for being our, our guide and our counselor, and for being there for all of us. Oh, mahalo kukui. Mahalo nai. Yeah. Uh, so many things come to mind when I think of you, Dan, in the best way possible. But you have orchestrated these wonderful conversations that have made us contemplate within this control van and even outside of it. And I know that I'm going to ponder these themes and concepts and the things that we witnessed here um, when I return home and back into Ao, into our realm and our conscious world that we live and work in. And I admire the person you are to your keiki, the father you are. I admire the teacher that you are, the kumu that you are, the counselor that you are. Um, you know, the uncle that you've become <laughs> to all of us, but also just a friend. You know, I told you in another watch that when I see you, I think of you as like, we're both 17 year olds, just having a blast out here sailing the ocean. But also I see you and you're a kupuna too, because you have that wisdom and you've had that exposure with the world and the way that you engage so compassionately with the people around you and just the environment around you. It's truly inspiring. Um, I take your words and it, it really means a lot and I know it means a lot to all of us and you have just continued to pour so much love and aloha and patience and kindness into everyone on board and I see how you interact with all of the people that you encounter and that it's a really beautiful thing so mahalo mahalo noe mahina aloha noe well said And that's it. If anyone else tries, I'm walking out too. <laughs> Going with Robert. <laughs> oh. No, totally, uh, totally love and, and uh, appreciate. I hope uh, those of our colleagues and our family back home, I know are going to be so excited to receive all of us um, in, in a few days when we return. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad to have these cherished friendships to carry forever. I still got yours waiting, Robert. I still got yours <laughs> The internet gets to hear it two times, man. You can't escape. You can't escape my love, Aquaman. <laughs> oh. I love it. I got the shout out to him. He can put it on. <laughs> I'm gonna get him while he's eating cookies on tomorrow. And I know where to go. Hide at the cookie tray waiting for Robert. <laughs> the inter internet wants to know if we take any energy enhancers. <laughs> what do you guys what do you guys do? Coffee, Red Bull? Caffeine. Well it's just a plenty of caffeine. Tea. Oh, I've tea. been taking so much allergy medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you drink coffee? Oh. I do. Oh, I don't sorry, sorry. Parents, um, I do drink coffee sometimes. Uh oh. <laughs> I know how I get when I drink coffee. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, I love it. Goodness. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out, but as the person who's like all of the above, I was like, um, I don't all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep, coffee, energy drinks, you name it. Ghost energy is the best. Mm -hmm. Ghost oh. energy. Okay, I never tried that one. Actually, you try them. They have different flavors. They have. Oh my gosh! So my favorite one is the green apple warhead. Oh! Yeah. Oh my gosh! That'll wake like you up. Flavors. Green apple warhead. They have green apple warhead. The recent one they came up with was the fruity. Actually, I got it up because they're having a sweepstakes right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> so <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of sugar. The internet says, "Yep, definitely actually, sugar too." <laughs> actually, there's zero sugar. Oh. Yeah. So they're my favorite ones. Because <laughs> I don't go to do good with sugar anymore. <laughs> <laughs> do they have 
they have hot wings with mayo. Hey. 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 We're about to get into this right now again. <laughs> By the way, welcome to our blue out, uh, blue water chat, <laughs> where we're probably going to be talking about food again. <laughs> oh, we talked about it all. Oh my God. Thing. Yeah, what was the result um, of that poll? I we tied. She, she uh, says. We tied. She says we tied. I don't I know. I have a feeling. <laughs> that last time I saw it. I voted a few different times. <laughs> <laughs> I voted once. So I, I voted once too. I only you, voted once. I voted once. I promise. Once for each, like finger. <laughs> <laughs> but there were three categories by the time I voted. <laughs> yeah, Ro I Robert the made the best vote of all. I saw Robert's <laughs> vote. So there is no clear winner. Got it. Don't know. <laughs> Apparently it was tied. I don't believe that. Oh my I don't gosh. Don't I think it was all a lie. Oh wow. Set up. Okay. All right. <laughs> we have it's a ground fault. Why do we have a ground fault? Uh oh. Do you have a crap fault? Yeah. Uh, what are we going to try? We're going to try a Doppler. Robert's making sure our electrical is all in order. Always paying attention. We are, someone asked about the setup here um, for operations. Uh, and we have a studio and a control van that are inside sort of three bundled containers, half containers that are uh, been modified, customized with all the screens you can see on, on uh, Nautilus Live. And um, it's a fairly comfortable setup. We got to keep it uh, the right temperature for the all of the computers, so it stays pretty cool. And this uh, is actually mobile. Yeah, they we can call it mobile. We, we can lift it right off, right? Yeah. Mm. You get yeah. A, these three containers. There's there's aluminum panels to put in here to pose them off. Wow. They can ship the whole mess. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I imagine that could sometimes ha need to happen. Uh, we haven't done it yet. We did have all this down in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, to. We were going to do a mission off of a, a ship down there, but that didn't happen. It's a pretty good setup, Robert. I imagine you've seen a few others on other ships. How does it, how does ours compare? This is the only triple wide that I know of. Yeah? Yeah. Got a pretty good amount of room. Yeah. Most of them are singles or double wides. I think, yeah, the Jason RLV is a double wide. Yes. Because yeah. a lot of the commercial ones are uh, wide The Millenniums were, they were single, but then the XLXs we had were on the inside of the ship. We didn't uh, have a, we didn't have a van. We, everything was all inside the ship, actually. Mm. So they made a, they, they, uh, demo, they demoed out, I think, like two, three rooms and made that whole the control room. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was nice, actually. It was like, it was so like, that's That's what they have on Falcor. Yes, and, yeah. Uh, and Bari also has a dedicated control room in the ship so, mm -hmm. so not mobile yeah kind of cool if it's mobile might be able to have some collaborations it's a bit of a traveling circus so it's a lot of stuff you know <laughs> <laughs> yes. <For sure. laughs> yes it, it takes is. a lot of time to demobilize and demobilize yeah that's yeah. why that's why you're a facilities manager, uh, aka uh, Robert Robert the Clown, uh, yeah. Ho host of the host of the circus. <laughs> yes. Host of the circus. <laughs> oh my goodness. You bring it up now while he's here. He's settled. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks for reminding me, Zach. <laughs> Good job, Padawan. You're now demoted, I'm sure, Robert. <laughs> no driving Hercules tonight for you, my friend. Robert. Yes. Our Aquaman. <laughs> you have lived a life like every children's dream, spent seeking the treasures buried beneath the ocean, and you bear the beauty and the scars of the depths to one day awaken from this child's dream to realize that you, my friend, in fact, are the dream and the treasure. We love you, Robert. Thanks for taking us on this deep sea journey for 
this whole expedition and for so long. Such an awesome, amazing, uh, adventurous career you've you've had and you have and you will continue to have. So <laughs> we appreciate well, you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Robert the Ringmaster. That's what comes in on the internet. That's it. I love it. I love it. Thanks for that reminder, Zach. You're welcome. You're welcome. The internet. The internet. <laughs> the internet wants to know if I'm going to turn it into a rap, a rap soliloquy. I might. That might be. That might be the morning's watch. I come back and if I have a good dream. Mm -hmm. Comes to me in a dream. I'll wrap it out in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kukui. I was going to tell you the flavors of the ghost energy drinks. Because <laughs> these are my favorite. Like, I could, you know, I'm like fiend over these things. So they got green apple, warhead, uh, tropical citrus. Ooh. Don't, don't panic about the video. I'm trying to find the ground fault. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, watermelon, uh, sour warheads, tropical mango, sour patch, red, which just says red, and they got a little blue raspberry sour patch, uh, orange dreamsicle, Swedish fish, cherry Swedish limeade. Fish. Yeah, they got Swedish fish. Interesting. Cherry limeade, the phase pop, which is like a bomb pop. Sorry, I'm going to kill the DSC. And then they got Bubblelicious. And then Co Pro Candy Bubblelicious. Wow, that's a, that's a lot. And then they came out with a new one recently. Oh, two new ones. They came out with a Sour Strips and what was the other one? Pink Lemonade. Sour Pink Lemonade. Oh, oh, the mezzo. So question, does the red taste like red? Yes, it does, actually. It really <laughs> wait, does. wait, what? It, it tastes like red. It tastes like red? It tastes like the red Sour Patch candy. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, it tastes like a literally like liquid form of the red Sour Patch. That's the best Sour Patch. The red, yeah. the red I, one. I don't know. know. I like the orange one. What? Who yeah. likes the orange one? No. Me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like red and green. We should have a we should have a little Sour Patch Kids little battle. We should like get them out. You know, we, <laughs> we might be able to get some from the 7-Eleven once we're back in port. <laughs> we yes. might. Yeah. Actually, they do have or ghost energies stash. there too. I still have some. Yeah. Wait, what? <gasps> they have ghost energies there at the 7-Eleven right there. I don't know where get off. Try them out because they're really good actually, but they're not like me. I can't really do other energy drinks. I've tried them before, my head always spins. Mm. And uh, like those are the ones that really don't make my head spin. I feel fine. I don't feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack. Mm. And plus, their powders are really good too. The supplement powders. Supplement powders? Yeah, they they do supplement powders. They do energy powders. Oh. Like whey and stuff like that. And it's all good. Oh boy. Well, Ghost Energy, if you're ever looking to switch some flavor palettes, hot wings with mayo is always oh, good. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a go-to. Queen needs to open a little food truck. Ill illuminating <laughs> us. <laughs> mayo or rust? Mayo, mayo or rust. Everything's going to be covered in mayo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I still prefer ranch. See, thank 11 you. times out of 10. Thank you. Thank you. I feel. <clears throat> I don't mind like a honey Dijon. Ooh, okay, that's good. <laughs> like a good. honey mustard. Oh. And an aioli, aioli sauce. Yeah. yeah. Aioli is basically just mayonnaise with flavor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sophisticated well, mayo. It's, you, got a, <laughs> you got a bunch of garlic dumped in it, which actually does make aioli pat, uh, palatable. Mm -hmm. You have that on ahikatsu with some furikake, white rice, mac salad. Mmm. Mm. That sounds good. We're all ready to be home. So many things we want to eat, but we're gonna we're gonna enjoy this ride mm -hmm. while it lasts. That sounds really good. You know, it's really it, it's over before we know it. Really yeah. I feel like any of these Huakai expeditions, um, voyages, like we're and when we go out to sea, in the back of our mind, we're constantly thinking about returning and or getting to our destination arriving at our destination, what it's going to be like, what it's going to look like. And I think we get so caught up in the things that we have to do up until that point and executing all of our responsibilities on board, all of the tasks, all of our kuleana, um, and just so caught up in tunnel vision and like just the working uh, day to day and the thoughts of arrival. 
at port or at our next destination that we often just forget sometimes to be in the moment. Mm. Um, and I have been guilty of that, especially with our Wi-Fi connection on board. I'm just oh. like, wow, I can, you know, get all kinds of work done while I'm at sea that I didn't anticipate being able to get done. But, Ooh, wow. Wow. Wait, stay there. oh, I just saw <laughs> the end of that. Yeah, it's beautiful. A very large beautiful. Tinafore. Yes. But I am looking forward to the transit back with you folks. Um, hopefully more nights of Kani Kapila. Yes, ah. Malia Evans is a beautiful voice. She's amazing. an amazing musician. She is. Um, and she just serenades all of us and just kind of rocks everyone to sleep in the sh as the sh you know, ship kind of moves side to side. It's perfect. Her voice is just so angelic. It feels like home, and that's always appreciated that, uh, you know, all the things we can find on board the ship that, that help, you know, remind us of remind us of home, the feeling of home, and um, it's been important to carry those with us into this uh, sort of long journey through space and time into Papahanaumokuakea, the realm of Kanaloa, and it's, uh, yeah, the depths of Pole, but still to to have that. I love Malia's uh, Ponamu. It's got a beautiful mm -hmm. stone, a jade stone from yeah. Aotearoa, um, and uh, wears for protection, but uh, on on Huakai on these on these journeys. But also, I feel like uh, just feels like something something from home. Surrounding ourselves with the energy of home mm -hmm. is uh, maybe the best protection when we make these long trips. Speaking of long trips, Brian from Aotearoa from New Zealand wants to know, how long will it take to get to the bottom? And uh, my guess is an hour. What's everyone else's guess? Uh, 74 minutes and 31 seconds. Oh, <laughs> could you look at that? Oh, man. So precise. Oh, 74 man. minutes. Yeah, yep. it's right, right there. <laughs> Robert and Kukui, they get the A+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> they had the cheat sheet. <laughs> Well, so do we, technically. Yeah, I know, but it's no fun if you look at it. Come on. Hey, Kikui, you might have to reset the still camera because I had to cycle power to it. Oh, okay. Ooh, thanks for the heads up. Model. You know, another name for uh, gardener is uh, pua honu, which means turtle surfacing from air, mm. which describes uh, in part its shape and then that tiny little bit of it that sticks up above sea level. Wow. <laughs> for Kukui and Mahina, mm -hmm. we've got a we've got a great question coming oh, in from no. the continent. They want to know, you know. They, they were informing us about this strange thing called Hawaiian pizza that oh, they have on the, in yes. the lower 48. And, uh, uh -huh. of course, we know what it is. But they wanted to know if this is a thing in Hawaii, and is it still called Hawaiian pizza, or is it just called pizza if you order it in Hawaii? <laughs> or do we call it pineapple with Canadian bacon? What do we, what do we, what do we call it? The latter. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, personally, I've just, I have, I'm not a fan of it. I don't. Enjoy it. I'm more of like a spinach, mushroom, garlic pizza oh. kind of gal. You like the savory stuff. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, you could throw some pineapple on spinach, mushroom, garlic. Ooh, that would be good. Uh, go well with the mushrooms, though. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Ooh, I prefer my pineapple on the side with lihing. Oh, there you or go. Or tahin. There you go. Or well, watermelon like with tahin. Grilled pineapple. Yeah. Ooh, that stuff's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, you know, Pineapple on pizza is one of the most polarizing topics you can throw at geology Twitter. Really? I'm serious. Anytime, uh, anytime somebody brings that up, it just turns into this giant debate. Geology. Like, it is so polarizing. <laughs> I love it. I, I do not prefer pineapple on uh, pizza either. Oh man! Me, it's got to be fresh, Have grilled, and on the side. Pineapple with jalapenos. Pineapple with jalapenos? Yeah. Like on, on a pizza? Oh, actually, yeah. Or just like... Actually, I that. tried that with the drink. That was actually really good. <laughs> Ooh, What's okay. I'm all that, about that. That would work. I'm all about craft beverages yeah. Yeah, like so that. That was really... I think it was like a it was like a rum drink or something like that, but I had a jalapeno and pineapple all mixed into it. Jalapeno and, and a drink? Yeah. See, that would... Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I do that all the time. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what they did, they... Come on. Like, I add jalapeno jam to smoothies all the time, Ooh. and it's, like, good on ice cream. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, I 
Yeah. Habanero. Try some of your jam. Uh, Ooh, habanero, that though. Habanero jelly is better, though, in my opinion. Habanero? Know, yeah, habanero jelly. Ooh, wait. Is that the, like KK? What's the difference between jalapeno and habanero? Different peppers. Just different peppers. Do they like, are they like the same spice Habanero level? spicy, yeah. Uh, uh, habanero habanero is more spicier, spicier, yeah. Spicy, okay. And it, it, uh, it tastes a little different, so it's uh, like, jalapenos kind of have that, that sweetness under all that spicy. Uh, oh. I, I don't really know how to describe habaneros. Habanero to me They're just mostly hot to me. To me, habanero is sweeter. Jalapeno has a more like a tangy taste to it, I guess you could say. Uh, okay. I guess in a way. Okay. Actually, I take the back, it's reverse. Habanero has a more tangy taste. Jalapeno has a sweet taste because jalapeno, yeah. when you cook it, it turns sweet. But when you cook habanero, it's more like a tang, and that's why it's good with mangoes. Yeah, mango habanero salsa is really, uh, really good. That is though. good. All right. Well, that answers that important question. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I would eat pineapple on pizza, but that's yeah, just me. Guaranteed. I wouldn't necessarily call it Hawaiian pizza, <laughs> uh, but I will add pizza. I will. I would add pineapple on my pizza to balance that sweet and salty. So, what would we call if we were going to have a pizza that was Hawaiian, in Hawaii? What would be on it? What would we put on that Hawaiian pizza? Oh, you, know, you, you make <laughs> the crust out of yeah. ulu. Oh, ulu crust. Nice. Ulu. And then, um, I, I'm actually kind of lost after after that. But like, hey, I'm good start. guessing you put some kind of like. Coconut sauce on it, like coconut cream milk that on it, oh. with some smoked taco or squid on it. Oh. I was thinking maybe unagi. Unagi, yeah. With a little, bit of, yeah. A little, little bit of eel sauce. Ooh. Yeah. That could be interesting. And you add some like cooked luo leaf on top for the for the spinach people, spinach loving people. Okay. What about like ogo? Oh, a little oh, bit of ogo, a little bit of limo on there. Come yeah. on. Yeah, so I don't know if that would fit the coconut the coconut flavor profile, but that would be yeah. fun to experiment with. A little bit of spam? <laughs> <laughs> oh, spam's a good one. No, no, no. I think I would I would go I'm I'm down spam with the ulu flour, ulu flour. But I would do like smoked meat with oh. onion and yes. inamona. Um, like my uncle Moku makes really delicious smoked meat, and really anybody back at home. And plenty of people hunt pig, so you could. There's a lot of people who smoke their own meat, brine their own meat. Um, Ooh, but Kalua I feel like pork. that's in always in like your freezer, like smoked meat. Yeah. And yeah, even Kalua pig. Kalua pig is yeah. That's, that's like that would be like a, a common item that I feel like you could put on. That would be but, tasty. Yeah. But what would this like? What the sauce, sauce would you do on it? Mm. Would you still do coconut like kind sauce on it, or would you like probably do not. something more like a? Probably not. How about Sorry. like squid luau? Like you mix the coconut milk yeah. with like the luau leaf, and you yeah. kind of let that simmer, and then use that as a sauce, and then add the smoked meat on top of that. What does the luau leaf do to the coconut? Like, how does it change the flavor? Um, so we have this dish called squid luo, and so it's basically like coconut milk um, with steamed like luo leaf, and you let that cook down, and then it kind of incorporates itself into the milk. Mm. And it's hard to describe the flavor, but it's more, it balances out the sweet flavor of the coconut milk yeah. a little oh, bit. And then you like, add the like squid or he in it, and then it brings, it balances that salty and sweet flavor out. That sounds pretty yeah. good. It's very rich. Yeah, yeah, it's very rich. It's like green and like thick and creamy. Um, it's delicious. A lot of people, you know, kind of, they, at the sight of it, it doesn't look as appetizing. So they probably, some people won't try it because of that reason. But, and then you can do it with, with, with whatever protein, chicken, um, beef, beef luau. Um, yeah. I think a luau pizza sounds interesting with some ulu crust. Yeah. Why not? We do yeah. squid luau pizza, beef some, luau pizza. If it's vegan, you know, we probably can have a lot of takers. The people in Kailua, <laughs> they would like to try that at a yes. Kailua mm. night market or something. I like the idea um, of ulu crust because uh can't do gluten. That would be an yeah. awesome there substitute. Go. There's actually a great place back at home too, Hawaiian Chip Company. Um, they ulu make, chips, yeah. Man. Yeah, they Ooh. make chips too, like fresh chips, like taro chips and uala, sweet potato, the purple mm. sweet potato. Mm, purple and sweet you can potatoes. get a whole box for $25 and it's like fresh. And then they have different seasonings that they make and you can like garnish as you wish with like a garlic seasoning or like they make Hawaiian Kilauea hot sauce, like barbecue hot sauce. Mm, that's and they good have a powder stuff. form of that. <laughs> um, oh, that sounds awesome. Great poo-poos. 
really close to our port and airport in the industrial area by Kalihi Makai. So no excuse to be one Aku bird. You got to bring something to the party. It's easy. Pick up some chips. Exactly. Pick up chips. some chips. Yeah. Yeah. Bring some something to the party. No, That's no, so just funny. show up with nothing. Hey, yeah, we've been talking about roll. that. That's how we yeah. always roll. You Even got if to. it's something yeah. small, it's a contribution. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Nothing to share. <laughs> oh, we're getting lots of good drink recommendations. Ooh. Yeah. Habanero whiskey is apparently really good. Don't oh, tell no. the kids. Whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And uh, jalapeno and chocolate brownies. Oh, oh I like mixing. Goodness, the yeah, mix. jalapeno and chocolate brownies. I'm gonna try it. Wow. I love jalapenos. Yeah, Me too. There we go. I'm gonna get a pizza with jalapenos on it when I get back yes. to Maryland. <laughs> Oh, they got bacon wrapped stuffed jalapenos at a place down the street from my house in Honolulu. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I, I make those sometimes. So good. Just dump a bunch of cream cheese into a, so into a uh, half of a jalapeno, wrap it in bacon, put it in the oven for like 10 or 15 minutes. And it's like, oh. Big, Have you big it with fresh chips? ones too. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so I got, Have you I got, coated it with like chips? Uh oh, Tex is going to Tex is gonna do us one up. I got really yeah, good. I got to one, one up us. I got to one up y'all. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> let's hear it. So we got something that's called Armando Lakes. And what it is, it's a uh, cut pepper. It can be jalapeno, whatever pepper you want. You cut the tip off of it. You stuff it with cream cheese and whatever sausage you want. I, um, sometimes, you know, you could do, or you just do shredded chicken, throw it in there, wrap it around in bacon. But then here's the kicker. So you get some whatever your choice of ground meat. It could be sirloin, it could be some, some, some kind of sausages, turkey, whatever. You wrap it around the pepper, and stick, and wrap it around the, in the uh, aluminum foil. Stick in the grill for about 10 minutes. Go back, open it up, cover it in barbecue sauce of choice, whatever sauce of choice you want. Cover it back up for another 10, 20 minutes. And there you go. That's our armadillo leg. And that, armadillo. Oh my God. Do you put it on good. a bun? Do you eat it like a, do you no, eat it like a hamburger? No, you, you just eat it like that. All right, armadillo egg. Armadillo. You, heard, you heard it here. 8 to 12, watch. Armadillo egg. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a recipe book, too. Oh my, a modest <laughs> recipe oh, book. That's a great idea. Food blog, recipe book, mm -hmm. isotope okay. stories. <laughs> Someone, Podcasts. maybe not from Houston, maybe from another part of Texas, maybe not from Texas, they said they're called rattlesnake eggs. They're called so armadillo I eggs. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a Texas showdown to me. Sounds uh -oh. like a Texas showdown. That's Car asking for trouble. Good old fashioned Texas eggs. showdown. <laughs> Yeah. I guess it depends where you go to, because I've always been called, always been told they're called armadillo eggs. That's I've funny. heard they've been called armadillo eggs. <laughs> Some of our fans noticed the pretty good little school of squid that came across the screen early in the dive uh, and wondering, you know, we're not seeing much here. Is this a is this an uncommon place to around a thousand meters? Or we is this, you know, can see a few uh, few creatures drifting across the screen. What do you think, Virginia? Thoughts? Was was the question? Is it just noticing? It's a it's a bit sparse. Yeah. Is it? You know, why aren't we why aren't we seeing more? We they saw those quite a lot of squid early on in the dive, wondering mm -hmm. where'd all the where'd all the creatures go? Yeah. So there's a lot of um, zonation that occurs in the deep ocean. Um, one of them being food availability. Um, uh, that is. Um, related to light availability. So the surface has a higher productivity. Um, that's where the phytoplankton are. Um, and then also in the evenings with the deal vertical migrators, that's where a lot of organisms actually move up to some of those surface depths where um, there's a higher abundance of phytoplankton. And then um, in the evenings when the, when the sun has gone down and it is uh, more difficult for predators to visibly see organisms um, on the, the, you know, um, based on like the shadows that the light projects and without that the sunlight, then it's, um, you know, the, the deal vertical migrators move up and um, start feeding on the, the phytoplankton and then the zooplankton are feeding on the, the zooplankton and then so on and so forth. Um, then you have things like squid that are also traveling up there as well. Um, so right now, I, w I would imagine that, you know, about 1,000 meters is a little bit quieter, um, but also the volume of space in this area um, and the 
It's just, uh, it's unbelievable the amount of water, you know, in this, in this region that it sort of dilutes like the number of organisms like there's still a high abundance of organisms here but it's more difficult to find them because yeah, there's sense. just so much in this area yeah. um, and there's not like those hard lines um, you know there's not unlike a seamount where you you have um, unlike the seafloor where you have things connected to the substrate like these organisms there's not a requirement for that substrate there's nothing that's kind of demarking their habitat besides, you know, pretty large um, boundaries in um, like, you know, temperature thermoclines or, right. or something that's like creating boundaries like a, a, a front or between currents or something, you know. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more space to find them. Yeah, mahalo for that. Makes, makes a lot of sense right now at night. The party's upstairs and mm -hmm. spread out really yeah. spread out because there's a lot of lot of room for people to move are uh, not people but well for people too but there's <laughs> no people out there but little creatures yeah, um, yeah. Oh, awesome turns out uh, just to just to so you know who you're up against Zach that uh, rattlesnake eggs came from my mom she says that's how that's what they call them in Tucson and uh, you better watch out she's small but but, uh, <laughs> but but feisty and mighty so yeah, apparently the folks in Tucson, Arizona call them rattlesnake eggs. Uh -huh. And we must have uh, some friends in the islands wondering how long <laughs> how long into a dive does it take for a kanakahui to turn to topics of food? Yeah, I know. Long, I long. <laughs> too soon. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it needs to. fastest was 10 minutes, right? Hmm? Yeah. That was it. Our fastest yeah. was about 10 minutes? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I got Something it like two that. minutes. Oh, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> Hey, that's pretty good. Hey, food talk happens when it needs to happen. Food talk is important. It I is. I want to say. My auntie Lahapa, she always says, opu contentment is very important. <laughs> and <laughs> opu in Olelo Hawaii is stomach or belly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to have yeah. that, that belly full, that con opu contentment. <laughs> and she says that whenever we're going out to eat, she's like, let's go get some opu contentment. And I'm yeah. like, yes. <laughs> That's what I plan to do once we get back into port and we're right uh -huh. next door to that poke bar. <laughs> yes, very much. I love it. Mm, yeah, that does sound nice. Mm. All of the luxuries of land, you know, to indulge in <laughs> the 7-Elevens with giant chests of ice cream and drinks <laughs> and Ghost all, all sorts of snacks. <laughs> Little Gummy candies, chocolate candies, wow. <laughs> the things we take for granted. It yeah? was so funny though. Really like the only bit of advice I got before I came on board the ship from mm -hmm. all of the other science communication fellows and so on was bring a lot of snacks and drinks. That, yes. was, that was the advice. And I brought none. I was like, yeah, what? They feed yeah. you on the ship. I've been on before, like right. it's fine. But then when you, the, the problem is when you watch all of your shipmates <laughs> eating all of their really good snacks and having their drinks, you start getting jealous. You're like, oh, yeah. Man. yeah. So it's not the problem of no snacks. It's the problem uh -huh. of jealousy, but it's hard to, it's hard to discern. <laughs> it's hard to discern uh, between uh, hunger and coveting. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, we all squirrel things away on these trips. If anybody needs, I have a lot of chocolate-covered protein bars from Costco. Oh. Ooh. If anybody needs. Oh, I might take one of those for my flight back. I have like 24, so... I'll take can. a couple of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have like 24. Oh, oh, yeah, you gotta fly across the country. I'm gonna be too. an awkward bird when they lay, everyone lays out all their snacks. I'm gonna be like, I, I didn't bring know. anything, but yeah. I'll take them. Oh, that's That'd so funny. Fun. I didn't even... So whenever I leave or go on any boats or va, I'm always so concerned about weight and how much mm. weight I bring on and like mm. every ounce counts. So that's kind of what I've been taught. And so this time around, I wasn't so sure of what was acceptable to bring on board. And I had spoken to some people, um, like Mel and I, but I didn't really go into deep, too deep about the details of like snacks and luxuries and things like that. Um, of course, I'm so grateful for all of the food. We get buffets, breakfast, lunch, dinner, oh cookie yeah. time, oh yeah. sugar cookies at three so today. So many different ice cream. choices. Had ice cream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at this, e this evening with dinner, but then after seeing everybody whip out like sparkling, sparkling water and sodas and ginger ale, I was just like, you guys brought cases on yeah. the floor? Zach's been making root beer floats. Yeah. 
Come on. I still yeah. have, I'm still hoarding some root beers, too. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> if only I knew, I would have just walked across to Costco and came back with, like, two shopping carts. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then just, like, filled up, you know, so, all of the space in my stateroom. <laughs> so I've seen some guys, too, on other boats. Uh, this is only, like, only on gas commercial boats. I've seen some guys actually bring stuff to cook on the boats. And then some of the cooks, if, they, if they're if they okay with you doing it, sometimes they'll let you go on there and cook your own meal. Because if you, wow. sometimes you get hungry, whatever. Why not? Wow. Oh, we got a, a great heads up. Uh, I'm going to make sure I star this comment so that uh, I can pull up this song later. But uh, it says, hello, Nautilus people. My partner Ray and I are keen live stream watchers. And last year we wrote a song, Blue Water about our expeditions. Oh, no. uh, can't wait to listen to Blue Water. I mean, we can't stream it now, but uh, yeah, we'll check it out on SoundCloud. And oh, that sounds like so much fun. Oh, mahalo. Thanks, Ray and partner. Yeah, mahalo. Yes, mahalo, Ray. So where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> We're starting at waypoint three because it's, they shorten the dive, and then it's going to be across a relatively low grad gradient area and then some oh. steeper, yeah. Eventually making our way up to this ridge way up here. All right, we're a little bit over halfway down. Oh, I don't cool. know what that was. Mm -hmm. Looked fun. Yeah. So why aren't we doing any of the shallower stuff? Because <laughs> other people are doing that? <laughs> um, talk to Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Are other people doing it? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, uh, the shallow reefs of Papahanaumokuakea should be uh, should be mapped and explored as well. Very much so. Things above a thousand meters. I think a lot uh, of them. Do, 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 I mean, do. you can do a lot of that from satellite images, though, can't you? Oh yeah. Mapping this, reefs. I mean, yeah, this this has not been. Not in three D. This well, has been we're mapped. Yeah. I guess so. the icy submarine did a lot of work here, though. They did some, but they probably also would have been deeper too. Not super deep, but still. Yeah, I wow, think I think the Falcor cool. mapped this as well. Mm -hmm. Mapped it, but not uh, they didn't take vehicles into the. Um, yeah. Not sure about that, but I think no. Huh. They also got a bunch of gravity data. Shows two volcanic edifices here. So one ginormous volcano, and then one a little bit uh, smaller, a little bit over to the west. Cool. Did you guys see that our, our Dumbo octopus, swimming Dumbo octopus friend, made it on the BBC? I saw that. Oh, was that did our watch? Yes. Oh, was that our watch? I did not see uh, that. I don't, I don't think, think it was, was our watch. I think it, it was 12 to 4. Was yeah. it the Jacob okay. one? Yeah. Was it the Jacob one? Please, it was the Jacob one. I'm not sure, but it's... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jacob, the lasers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I'm on ragging him in the comments. But it almost talk. feels like we were on the BBC. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, Megan was wow. doing an interview with them earlier today. Very cool. Wow, that's so awesome. We have a new viewer tuning in who says, I've seen some footage down deep in the ocean where there were bizarre looking creatures barely visible, only with lights. So bizarre they appear almost alien. Can we expect to see some of these? Not at all. Very yes. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything here is that only is, visible by lights. We're is, bringing the lights with us. We are. Yeah. And, this, and it is. we are going to see some uh, some alien-looking, almost otherworldly creatures, almost guaranteed. In fact, there is something called an E.T. sponge because it looks like an extraterrestrial. That's true. <laughs> so. All the creatures, I think we get a little used to them. They're not so strange anymore mm -hmm. to us, but actually... Can you? I mean, if like you had never seen it before. Some of these basket creatures. Basket stars. Are <laughs> so oh yeah, those cool. are pretty. Basket stars look so wild. Yeah. Unless you've stared at them a million times and you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I still like the bright yellow bolasomas. Oh yeah, those, those are, are cool. Those are pretty spectacular. This is this is the first cruise I've ever seen them on. Really? The bright yellow ones. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ooh, that's yeah, exciting. It's kind of fun. 
fun. Yeah, I didn't even know bright yellow was a thing in the deep sea until mm -hmm. uh, I was on 138 last year. Mm -hmm. But uh, You saw more of the yellow sponges, or was it for the yellow analopsomias? Uh, the yellow stalk sponges. Um, yeah, we saw we saw a lot of those in parts of uh, the Lilio Kalani chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prior to that, I was nowhere near this deep because we were diving, you know, in Northeast Lao Basin. It's a little shallower there. Yeah. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the, the hydrothermal systems, mm, as well cool. as as well as some rock samples, which I would love to work on because we found some interesting rocks there and uh, some unusual mineralogy and it's something I've always wanted to follow up on. So, but I don't have access to them at the moment. Ah, uh, that's a bummer. It is a bummer. I also don't have any money to work on them. So, uh, so a bummer. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah they'd basically, I'd basically end up getting them if hand that were the case. Bummers. Then they'd just sit in my office until I had the money. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice paperweights, though. Some of them quite large, yeah. Mm -hmm. Door stoppers? Yeah, there was one that we brought up that I think weighed about 65 pounds, and Ooh. we just, like, put it on the porch, mm -hmm. <laughs> put an arm over it and then uh, locked the arm and ascended that way. That's quite large. It is extremely large. It took two of us to lift it. it was what do not, you do it was, with it? It was not my decision to take that sample. Ah, uh -huh, uh -huh. I, I was actually a little bit worried because I knew it was gonna be so very uh, difficult yeah. to maneuver on a what ship. Do you, how do you even, it's got its own bunk then, you know? It literally did. Yeah. You, you, know those, uh, you know those plastic storage boxes with the flip tops, mm -hmm. like the ones I used in Breaking Bad? Yeah, mm -hmm. we cleaned out an extra one of those, mm -hmm. and uh, that became that rock's home. Yep. 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 It did. It have its own It earned own the birth. nickname King Tut. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. It's a, nice, it's a nice piece of basalt, but there's just too much what of it. What cruise was that? Uh, this is one of the Valcourt cruises in 2017. Oh, I think FK 171111, something like that. <laughs> one of the crew. It's like, I was told there would be erupting volcanoes on this one, and you're not delivering <laughs> to, to the chief scientist. We're like, well, sorry. We, we did spot evidence of recent eruptions, though, but we just weren't there for the actual eruptive thing. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's a very active field of young volcanoes there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, sometimes you get lucky and you catch them like Robert did. Um, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you're a little less lucky, but you still get some incredible geological samples. Well, did you so. find video for that? Uh... Wait for, for... Oh, yeah, uh, for his... Yeah. Uh, yeah. You said oh, yeah, you could on... What, where could you find it? Uh, you can find it on YouTube. So, uh, here we go. But what would, what were the, you said Lao? Lao Basin, eruption. That'll probably do it. Eruption. Coffee There's, can? Uh, coffee um, can? I don't yeah, know if coffee, coffee can, can will work. <laughs> oh, I might have found Aquaman it. Aquaman coffee can. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> when do we think that was? For, for those who are uh, tuning new in to us for the first time, we're, uh, oh, we're new just reflecting back on great moments from 20, this dive. 2009, when Robert told us he was the one sampling the lava with the coffee can. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Tito did. He might have. He was on the same cruise. You guys went down with multiple coffee cans, huh? Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> it was a sink. <laughs> Ooh, I probably, I don't know what the sound's going to do. Wow. Wow. Isn't that cool? What the heck? Submarine volcanism. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's only 50 seconds. That almost looks like extraterrestrial kind of stuff. I can't believe that's underwater. Oh, Dr. Val, interesting question coming in. Is the um, the volcanic rock that's formed directly in the ocean during an undersea eruption, is that going to be heavier or lighter than uh, its counterpart above, above the surface? Uh, it's going to be pretty similar. Pretty uh. similar. The pressure doesn't make it any more dense and more or less dense, anything like that. I suppose it could under certain settings, but we still see a lot of uh, vesicles forming um, in submarine lavas. Yeah. So 
Yeah, pretty pretty similar all around, but um, sometimes you actually can generate pumice from uh, submarine eruptions, and that will that will go float up at the surface. That's right. For a while, it eventually gets waterlogged and sinks. And pumice is is, is purely uh, uh, created in submarine eruptions. You don't get pumice stones ejecting from uh, above above you, sea volcanoes. You, you, can. Or you can. You yeah. Can. Um, the uh, like the golden pumice that you get at, uh, uh, at the Hawaiian volcanoes. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. We see it on the Big Island. And you can get them from uh, arc volcanoes as well, sub subaerial or submarine. So right. they're above water or below water is what that translates to. Awesome. We are uh, taking your questions, your comments, your stories, your uh, recipes, <laughs> your. No more song requests. I don't think anybody wants to hear me sing anymore. But uh, yeah, we're, we're taking it all. You can send it in on Nautilus Live if you're if you're tuning in on YouTube. Jump over, uh, hang with out, hang out with us on Nautilus Live, and uh, yeah, stay tuned. We're, we should be down on the bottom in just over half an hour. We are just passing 1,500 meters depth, almost a mile beneath the ship, and still just about a thousand meters above our target on the sea f on the sea floor well on this uh ono nui ono iki volcano incredible ancient volcano viewers wanted to know has any trash or fishing gear been found on this expedition and yes actually um i know of at least three instances where we came across kind of derelict uh, fishing gear that had sunk down into the depths humans are um having an impact for sure even on the mm -hmm. deepest parts of our ocean and the remotest parts of the pacific so um we didn't see any trawl marks though right i don't i don't i don't, think I don't so. recall seeing any evidence no, of trawling I don't, I don't on the seamount i don't believe we've seen any trawl marks yet. see that's how you make a pillow basalt mm -hmm. <laughs> the back row here googling oh, the watching youtube just like they're at home <laughs> that place is literally called Fr uh, shrimp city on the maps yeah. <laughs> oh, we got one viewer trying to, uh, you know, trying to scoop the, the news of the rare Dumbo octopus that the BBC reported that we found. <laughs> and uh, maybe if they're followers, they know that, oh, we actually saw several on our mm -hmm. last couple of dives. Um, one of the I, watches has a record seven spots. Amazing. Seven wow. spots. We Wait, only have this one. Cruise? That yes. being said, Jerks. that being said, <laughs> they are still. We love the They're other the watches. Dumbo Virginia Oscar. is joking. Virginia is joking. It's not their fault. Uh, well, maybe it is, but uh, <laughs> we, we still love them. We got um, one. We got one. We did. Yeah, we did. It, was, yeah, it was a beautiful. And, it was beautiful. And it was, it was kind stunning. of adorable, and it ran head first Crashed into a into coral. The <laughs> coral. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then it sat down for a while. <laughs> And then we left. Aww. Yeah. That is so cute. So, but still fairly rare. We have to, we don't know for sure because so much uh, about the deep sea remains unknown. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely a rare sighting. It's a rare sighting of a Dumbo octopus because you have to do a lot. Got to travel out to remote sea mounts in the middle of the ocean and dive robots quite deep uh, and get really lucky. Yeah. We didn't see the, the googly eyed ones like you see on the website, though. The, the very True. Ones, hmm. the, yeah. We did see a googly eyed fish at one point. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was memorable. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. Was that the Tonicops or was that another Google uh, I think fish? that was one of the fish from uh, when we were up in the uh, possibly a crater, possibly a caldera, but maybe <gasps> oh, not. Oh, oh, that one. Oh, yeah. That was cool. Oh, I was going to say was last night, but it definitely wasn't last night. It yeah. wasn't a tripod. It wasn't a macroid. It was... That was one of the um, macroids, but it like a macroid? true macroid, I think, uh, right? The one that had like, the kind of wild looking oh, eyes. Oh, the one that kind of had like those ghostly shaped little eyes? Yeah. Well, th those are cool. <laughs> so what's the difference between a true macroid and the not true macroid? There isn't. It was just uh, my brain. Oh. It's just a differentiation in <laughs> uh, only my okay. brain. Okay. No Never one mind. else's. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> only my brain. 
A couple other questions coming in. One is channel three on the boat. Yes, it is. We can wave to you live in the control van. Everybody wave at the viewers. This is us. We're here on the <laughs> ship. <laughs> and uh, this, is, uh, this is where it all goes down. This is our control van on the upper deck of exploration vessel Nautilus. The other question is, uh, how old were you? This is for all of you. How old were you when you knew you wanted to do deep ocean expeditions? How old were you? Robert, we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Just I was certainly into the ocean when I was young, but I don't know if I was thinking about doing deep sea expeditions. So, so I was, uh, how old was I? I was like 33 or something, I think. All right. That was just a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zach, how about you? How old were you? Jeez. Um, probably say 12, 13 or something nice. like that. Because it was me and my best friend at the time. We're still really good friends. Um, his name is Michael Redman. I don't know if he ever... Oh, I told him about was out here, so I don't know if he ever tunes into this, but maybe he'll hear this eventually. So, me and him a long time ago, we found this really cool game. It was online. It was a little, it was a little PC game. It's called. It was. It's a little dorky little, <laughs> little hunting game, but it's called Shark Hunting of the Great White Shark, and it's a like a, it's an old old game, you know, old PC game. And ever since then, we were like into the ocean. I was really into the ocean. That kind of what drove me into it. And then slowly over time, I got more into it, started reading about it, got into aquariums and stuff like that. And that's what kind of like the pinnacle of everything. Where I kind of like wanted to do more in-depth stuff, like see what other people have been able to see. So that's kind of a precursor for me to try to get into ROV for like the longest time. And um, yeah, that's how I got into it. Awesome, Zach. Thank you. Amber? Oh, boy. Well, I've always loved the ocean, but I think I didn't really look at it as a, a career path until I w went back to school for my oceanography degree. So that would have been when I was about 27. Oh, last year. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Amber. I'll take it. Nice. <laughs> Catalina Del Mar? Um, yeah, I guess I've always been interested in the ocean and wanted to make a career in it, but like specifically with the deep sea. Um, I didn't see it. I didn't realize it was possible until I, I got to work in a deep sea biology lab in like 2017. Um, yeah. Awesome. I guess that, yeah. Very cool. Kukui? Um, like what's been said before, I guess, I've always been interested in the ocean um, since I was little. Um, but I didn't know that deep sea exploration was uh, was a thing until I got to college and Even then I didn't know like how to begin to investigate that field um, and then I think the semester of my senior year last year last summer. Yeah um, I got the opportunity to apply and so I was like, okay, full send Yeet. Mm. And then, <laughs> and then I was blessed and fortunate to come on uh, last year, last summer, and yeah, it's been an amazing and a huge blessing to me. So, I'm awesome. grateful for yeah. it. Virginia. Uh, yeah, I uh, I did a lot of my my career not really knowing about the deep sea very much. Um, I met, I got. I actually did get a bachelor's in marine science, but um, uh, we didn't cover much of the deep sea. Um, it was very much focused on the intertidal zone, which is a great area and very cool. But um, and so it actually it took me getting. Um, uh, I was working on boats um, at a pretty somewhat physically demanded demanding job, but not a mentally demanding job. And that, so it kind of took me getting bored on boats and like trying to figure out what I can do beyond that job um, before I started researching. I started researching what other people were researching um, at some of the schools that I had been told were good schools to get a master's or another degree at. And so then I went from, you know, 
then I, f I found someone who was working on hydrothermal vents and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And then, you know, then uh, I, my curiosity was piqued and I, I went and got a master's and, um, you know, and now I've, and now I've been working in the deep sea. But yeah, I don't really know when exactly that happened, but I, th I think it, I think really and truly it was, um, you know, during that period of time when I was working on boats. I love that. And I, um, I often give the advice to people when they mm -hmm. say, how do you figure out what you want to do? I tell them to go be bored for a while mm -hmm. and they'll eventually figure it out. Totally. So. <laughs> uh, well? Um, kind of a complicated story in some ways, but you know, spent, um, you know, parts of my summers growing up, uh, in the Lake Superior shoreline. So it was always kind of immersed in some of that, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the marine culture, the stories, terminology, uh, you know, watching uh, ore boats and, pa and uh, container ships and stuff go through the uh, uh, Great Lakes system, uh, you know, out of the Sioux Locks and mm. up into uh, open Lake Superior and back. So that's always been kind of a big fascination of mine. And then, uh, yeah, I've said it a couple times uh, uh, on previous watches, but uh, yeah, it would have been about eight or nine years old when I learned about uh, the Jason Project through school, uh, which is um, sort of, an, I, I guess, an earlier incarnation of uh, uh, Nautilus by Dr. Ballard. I thought that was the coolest thing, but I never thought that, you know, it, it never even crossed my mind that that could become a reality. And uh, I didn't think about much of uh, that kind of an opportunity again until I was um, a PhD student and my advisor got funded to uh, uh, do some work um, quite a bit south of here, uh, pretty close to uh, Samoa. And I, I caught the bug. So <laughs> that would have been about 26 for that expedition. That was t 10 years ago. That's when the love affair with submarine volcanoes started. Yep, that, that was a dredge cruise. So we didn't have ROVs or cameras or anything going down. It was a uh, 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 purely geologically oriented uh, expedition, but I had a blast. I learned a ton about like, you know, sample processing uh, uh, and, and and like deck ops and all sorts of other stuff, a little bit of mapping. Yeah, found out I really enjoyed it. Awesome. And so I love awesome. the chances that I get to go back out. And it's, you know, it's not every year. Sometimes they come in little clusters and then I don't do anything at sea for a few years, but you know, it's, it's a nice little, uh, Nice little, little break from uh, routine every now and again that I really appreciate. Outstanding. Thank you, Val. Mahina? I, kn I knew I wanted to voyage or go on a deep sea voyage when I was 13. And I was able to sail on a Va'akaulua, a traditional Hawaiian sailing canoe called Makali'i out of Hawaii Island, Big Island, or Mokuokeawe. That was my first time being on a double-hauled sailing canoe and learning about our ancestors and how they traversed the seas and how they settled the seas. Um, that was my first time on a canoe of that size. And that's where I felt at home and connected. And that's also where I felt liberated. And to see the land to see like the Aina and the cliffs and the Kohivi, the mountain range from the ocean was incredible. Um, and then after I had uh, a different internship that sent me to Koho'olawe to do restoration work there after the years of bombing that had happened on that island and uh, we actually got to go up to um, Mua'ula'iki which is there's a sitting stone up there and it's called the navigator's chair. And that island of Koho'olawe, otherwise known as Kanaloa, um, was used for as a school for navigation, for astronomy. It's low lying and you could also see the different channels in between Hawaii Island, Lanai, Maui, Moloka'i. And on a clear day, you can see all of the different islands in the distance on both sides from where you're standing on that point, that pu'u, that mound. Um, and I was probably, I was 21 when I was able to go over there. And when I was sitting there, I wasn't involved with Polynesian Voyaging Society at the time or like the Ohana Va'a. And I just remember like that, that dream of wanting to be on a deep sea voyage had come back to me in my young adult life. And 
then shortly after, I started getting involved with PBS and Hokulea and Hikianalia. And then that dream became a reality last summer. And it continues to just be a, a lifestyle and a community and a ohana family that I can lean on for support. Um, but I, it's a relationship. It's just a pilina. It's a connection that we have to our ocean, um, to the living things, to the, the things that call our ocean home. So just always maintaining that relationship, that connection. Oh, it's beautiful. Mahalo, Mahina. Mahalo, everyone. I'm, I'll say that uh, for me personally, it was... I love the I love the reference to dreams. I think from the time I was very little and, and kind of the nature of dreams is that they come and then they go and they come and they go and uh, you can never quite wrap your hands around them or your head around them. Um, they're slippery, a little bit like Kanalo. And um, but yeah, for me, dreams from the time I was a young child um, of going out into the ocean, going deep into the ocean and, uh, you know, used to imagine it as a kid. Um, have all different kinds of moments throughout my career where the deep sea has been brought back into my dreams and uh, been, been made part of my life. And um, this one, I would say this experience is, is the most uh, spectacular dream so far. So yeah, it's happening all the time, being renewed in all of us. So um, no matter when it begins, uh, it's the ocean is like that, yeah? It breathes in, breathes out, covers us. Mm -hmm. recedes away and keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So excited to immerse myself to hop in the ocean when we get back oh, to port. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> one of the most exciting things about landing. <laughs> if anyone has a flight on uh, when we get back into port and needs to go straight to the beach so they can get in the water, you let us know. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure that happens. And, yeah. uh, yeah, happy, happy for that. I know it's definitely where I'll be headed. Mm -hmm. I think most of you all leave the 28th, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think so. Oh, a great question coming in uh, from from our online viewers. Thanks again for sending in your questions and comments. Another one says, "Would you say that deep sea exploration is Earth's final frontier?" <laughs> um, I, I would say I hope not. Um, I think we'll always have more to explore and there's uh, the earth is always evolving and changing so I don't not even sure I like the idea of a frontier but uh, but I do think that it's important for us to know it and map it so much of it is unknown so in a lot of ways uh, in terms of putting things on the map um, here on Earth, I don't know. Dr. Val might say the interior of the Earth maybe is as much of a front. We, we got to go deeper. We got to go all the way in. And but, humans uh, have never been on the other side of that wall. Yeah. That's Chances right. are we might not ever be. Well, so that's we okay too. yeah, so we look for clues on the seafloor to try to understand that as well as we can. But um, final frontier, I don't know. Uh, very much unexplored. Yes. Yeah. Or underexplored. I like that. That's the more correct term. Correct. Because we've been exploring it. Exactly. So some of it's exploring. I'm a little tired, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. It's it was a rough 24 hours there for a bit. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Val has a has a really great uh, a, a great room on board the ship, except it's all the way up near the bow. And if you've been in heavy seas in the bow of a large mm -hmm. ship, you know that that's uh, basically like a springboard. So... Uh, yeah. Dr. Val was ping-ponging between the ceiling and her bed <laughs> while Some, trying to sleep. Something like that. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, my brain and my stomach were not cooperating. Well, so I'm doing okay for now, though. It's part of the exploration. You're doing great. Sure is. Yeah, you're doing great. yeah I, I hung out most of today at the midline. So <laughs> it, was, it was much better. Awesome. Yeah, it's feeling pretty good. It's feeling pretty good up here yeah. in, the, in the control van. Not, yep, not it was a source of much relief when we stopped and things suddenly got a lot more stable. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can do this. Has, uh, has anyone, I forget, has anyone in here been in a submersible or been in a submarine or been down? I know Robert has. Anyone besides Robert? No? No, nope, I've just been down to the bottom of my open water certification depth. Yeah, that's A whopping good. Uh, 80 feet. That's wow. pretty good. Yeah, 25 meters is a nice... Uh, 
25, 30 meters is a great depth. And, mm -hmm. uh, but Robert's, Robert's been down. He's the only one in the van. Someone asked if we'd been, uh, if any of us have ever dived underneath the water. And if so, how far? And Robert, wasn't isn't your record 6,100 meters? 6,110. Yeah. 6,110. Wow. 6,110 meters. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, how long pretty. How does that take to get down? <laughs> Did you hear that? How what? long? How long does it take to get down there? To that depth? Um, it was a little over two and a half hours, I think. So, yeah, when Alvin dives deep, they they really load it up with a lot of steel so it's going up and down pretty fast oh, like okay. we, we did almost 50 meters a minute so oh wow yeah yeah double the speed we're descending at right now yeah what about others the deepest depths how far have we how, how far is if we free dove or scuba dive what's the deepest people have gone uh -huh. 120 120 oh, nice. feet, nice, 40 meters, so that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's about where I've been. With the, with the Sears compressor? <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe in the, the blue hole in Belize. Oh, nice, oh. beautiful. beautiful. That's, you gotta drop down pretty deep there to, to get to where all the stalactites are. Mm. Mm. That's cool. That's cool. Love it. I think I've been only to 102 feet nice. scuba diving and then um, 60 feet free diving. Oh, wow. good job, Kukui. No, it's actually really, it's really awesome. And when you keep when you keep training for it, like, and you, you know, like, you learn the technique to go down, you can go down pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I feel free. like. Everybody can do it. Free diving is a lot of fun and can actually a great way to go deeper than we than it's safe to go diving with uh, kind of standard gear. So uh, yeah, big. I'm a. I give a big thumbs up to free diving as a practice. And it's good for mindfulness and mental preparation as well. And yeah. I feel like it's also really good to like uh, for circulation for your circulation too to kind of like control that sometimes. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, like you said, it's really good for mindfulness and knowing knowing your body and getting to know your body even better. Yeah, that. So. <laughs> I saw. <laughs> Oh, we love it when uh, Dr. Val's mom chimes in, and uh, we've got her up, got her up getting ready to make armadillo eggs and jalapeno poppers at four, <laughs> at four in the morning. Wow. Wow. Yes, uh, mom, go back to bed, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do get the, we do get the vote for best watch from Dr. Val's mom. Oh, so. that's so kind. Yes, uh, <laughs> Mahalo, Nui. And only minutes away from bottom, we should be down right around uh, 10:40 Hawaii time. Gives us about an hour and 15 minutes mm -hmm. or so to explore um, before we'll hand it over to the awesome 12 to fours. But uh, yeah. Oh, has the team ever explored the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Well, no. I don't know, Robert. You've done it. You. Uh, no. Nope. You've been nope. topside for any of those expeditions? No. Nope. Um, no. Nope. We've been over by Guam, but not. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the yeah. deep challenger deep you've uh, got to have really specialized uh, really s specialized robots or submarines submersibles to uh, to head down to the deepest part of our ocean yeah wasn't it uh, James Cameron who was one of the most recent folks yeah. to go down he was yes. yeah yeah with a uh, very very specially designed very safe sub from yeah. what I understand. Safe, right there. Safe -ish. Oh, cool. oh no. of course Robert has a picture of it. <laughs> what is it? Don Wright, also head of uh, Watch your headset. Head of uh, ocean science and mapping at oh my uh, gosh. Esri. <laughs> wow. So awesome. Robert. That's so yeah. cool. Um, Robert showing off his <laughs> awesome picture wow. with uh, with the submarine. So that's at our facility in San Pedro now. Oh, wow. cool. Yeah. Okay, now we all need to go visit San Pedro. <laughs> Just give a plug for Don. It's not She's set up yet, but it will be. That's cool. 
I believe Dawn became the first African-American woman to, to get to the bottom of Challenger Deep. Um, pretty pretty amazing accomplishment for her. And uh, she does amazing work with Esri, the mapping company, and uh, very, very much promoting uh, mapping the oceans. So all of us, of course, should be big fans if we're not already. Dawn's a, a great ally and leader and explorer in the community. So yeah, amazing. That is. Yeah, closest I've come to the Marianas Trench is uh, transiting over it in 2013 because uh, we, we started our cruise in Guam and had to transit for a week to get to our uh, our first sample target. Like, that was a big deal. Like, a bunch of people woke up for the crossing, like, bridge called down to uh, uh, the science control room and everything. Wow. That is cool. Question. A lot of, there's a lot of water under you. <laughs> there's a lot of water down there. Yeah. That's true. Just a bit. Just a wee bit. Seven miles down, no big deal. <laughs> I can't even run that. Neither can <laughs> I. <laughs> Folks wondering if the story 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea provided inspiration for any of us. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure it might have, but interestingly enough, our, our founder, Dr. Bob Ballard, mm -hmm. inspired very much by the movie. My favorite part of the story is that he's very clear that it was the movie and not the book, and he celebrates his uh, dyslexia and his struggles um, with uh, reading as a as a child. And so, I love that because someone who's become so accomplished in uh, ocean exploration, a leader in the field, around respected around the world, a bit of a global star actually in in uh, ocean science and exploration, and um, he's gotten all the way there um, while overcoming uh, whatever challenges of dyslexia presented themselves so i think you know if you're out there and you're listening no matter what your challenges are ocean exploration is definitely for you too if it's something that you love and you're interested in so mm -hmm. pretty awesome story yes. robert somebody wants to know about the lasers what do they want to know about the lasers? They want to know what are they? What are they? What are they? And how far in front of the ROV do they merge? Oh, never. They never merge. <laughs> I'll answer that part. That's just an optical <laughs> illusion. <laughs> yeah, they're ten centimeters apart. How Forever. far? How far can they penetrate through water? How far do those lasers travel? Um, any, any idea? Far enough? Yeah, probably 20 meters. Oh, cool. I think. Not too yeah. high-powered. That's good. We've done some experiments with uh, sending video over light through water. You know, communication, optical communication. Yeah. How'd that go? I think they can... I think they're up to like 120 meters is like the best they've gotten. So you could uh, communicate with another small kind of untethered uh, autonomous vehicle or something. That yeah. was, uh, that's pretty cool. I'm using optical signaling, that's... Uh